Come on, baby. Here she comes, boy. The fishermen of Cornwall. For hundreds of years, they've worked some of the richest fishing grounds in the world. When you've got a, a nice bag of fish come up, I don't think there's a better feeling in the world, you know. There's fish! fish. There's fish! It's a way of life handed down through generations. I'll be the youngest in the fleet. That's not a bad status to have, is it? Well, we start today anyway. <laughs> Woman overboard! Oh, no! Now a sea change is coming, the biggest the industry has seen in 50 years. Fishing is the acid test of Brexit. Taking back control of our waters, a brighter future beckons. Yeah. It was either vote to stay in or vote to get out, wasn't it? Just get out, like. Beautiful. What's life really like, living and working in the wild west of Britain? can I ask for a better office. One thing a youngster these days needs is steady money coming in, and fishing doesn't guarantee that. And what does the future hold for this fishing life? Bigger the boat, bigger the balls, mate. I am in a gambling mood today, yeah. When you're at sea, fine weather, and there's a bit of fish coming over the rail, there's no better job. There isn't a better job in the world. BBC now, here's the shipping forecast issued by the Met Office on behalf of the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency. The aerial forecasts for the next 24 hours. Portland, Plymouth, North Biscay. Southerly, 4 or 5, increasing 6 or 7. Rain later, good. Occasionally moderate later. It's autumn in Cornwall. When the storms roll in, size really matters. Newlyn is home to the biggest boats in the Cornish fleet. Boats that can work through all weathers. Giant netters and trawlers up to 100 feet long. These boats can fish hundreds of miles offshore and stay at sea for over a week at a time. I have a bit. I do. It's a job of high risks and high rewards. Only the brave need apply. And finding men made of the right stuff gets harder every year. I first started down here as a boy, down under the sheds here. You had to come down every morning and stand and wait under the sheds. There'd be all the crews this end and all the skippers the far end. And as they walked past you, you'd be told, you're on a Philadelphia, you're on a Twilight, you're on a Webster. As you can see now, there's not many people waiting there for a job this morning. Steve's boat, the Billy Roney, a beam trawler, is one of the biggest and oldest vessels in Newlyn. There's 24, 25 beamers here. You know, as you can see now, the quay's pretty much empty. Back then, the harbour was full up. But even now, with the lesser boats now, we, we're still struggling to find the crews to put them to sea now. Yeah, it's just a pity. We haven't got any new fishermen starting into it, then we haven't got people going through the ranks and working up to the skippers, so we need an influx of, of younger men coming into the industry to come through and replace the men that are leaving. Drop it your side and we'll cut yours off. 28-year-old Danny Fisher is the engineer and deckhand. All right, join up on this side, mate. In a port where the average age of skippers is nudging 60, Danny's bucking the trend and training for the top job. Right, so watch yourself on that rope there now. Yeah. He spent the last 10 years learning the ropes and has recently been going for his skipper's ticket. I've got a reset on my chart work in November now it is. So he's been on at me about it, so better do it. I'll get it this time though, I know we'll have to. All the pressure's on. He's got pressure on me, the office they got pressure on me. Yeah. I want to get it, but I need to get it, really. You know, if I want to advance up a bit more, I'll, I'll need to get it. This is the only thing holding me back now. So as soon as I've got that, I'll go mate, and then hopefully, oh, be a relief skipper. But yeah, I'll be the youngest in the fleet here to get it if I do get it. That's not a bad, bad status to have, is it? Right. 
Y ellos ahí. I was like, that far. And that was exact, that's what that was. <laughs> dad was fishing, his dad was fishing, uncles were all fishing. And so it's just a natural way to go, really. I didn't really have much GCSEs or anything in school. I was always down the pier messing about with boats and stuff. So I just naturally fell into it when I left school and went from there, really. Boom! Just want to prove myself a little bit, you know? None of my family have ever been skippers. So I want to take it out one more step and you know, get out there. When he's aboard the boat, I can't fault him. I've got no qualms with him at all. He looks after the engine room, and if there's something wrong, he's on it straight away. I've got no problems now. I'd put Danny into the wheelhouse now. I've got no issues with Danny doing the job, but you've just got to have this bit of paper that goes with it that says you can do it, though. The crew of the Billy Roney are preparing for what could be a rough week at sea. I'm just greasing the blocks prior to sailing, mate. I'd rather do it here than out there, though. Milk, bread, butter. First Tea mate, bag. John the Pud, is Tea checking bag. the weekly Ordinary shop. Peas, fruit and fibre for the skipper because he's on a diet. John the Pud, we look after our John, even though he is an aggravating bugger. He, he is mate on the boat after me, but we tend to keep him in the galley best we can, and uh, he'd do a bit of chefing as well. And then the other John, he'll be making the gear and doing a lot more of the pulling and lugging. Beef for a stew. Go have a stew. Go, it'll be cold out there. Go have a stew. John's now 70, I'd say 74, I think, this year. He'll tell me I forgot that wrong, but he's one of them men, that's all he's ever done. When I started officially, I was 15. But I'd gone to sea uh, before that when I was uh, seven year old. I had to go with uh, my old man when I was on school holidays. He said, well, you're on holidays. He said, you might as well come to sea with me. Seven year old. Let's go. Some fishies. The Billy Roney heads out into the western approaches. It could be eight days until she's back in port. About five hours take us to get where we're going, four or five hours, and then we get started. Cornwall sits on a maritime crossroads, the meeting point of two ocean currents. They bring both cold and warm water species. For generations, Cornishmen have harvested some of the richest waters in the world. We used to catch phenomenal amounts of fish. I mean, every sort of fish. I mean, I did pelagic fishing. I can remember leaving Plymouth at 9 o'clock in the morning. And in two hours, we'd filled the boat up with 40 tonne of fish. It's pretty good, pretty good. Filled the boat up many times. I went away on one of the Newland trawlers once, catching prawns and, and cod on the 70-footer. That was an experience. We used to do six-hour tows, and you've never seen so many prawns in your life. I was sat on one side, and my mate was the other side. We couldn't see one another. Well, that was beautiful, catching prawns, beautiful prawns. Chrome sandwich every day for dinner. <laughs> I had a short job before I started, and we were on 13 quid a week. And we went on to the macro, we were on 80 quid a day. So you can just imagine what the difference was. We used to pull in on average, if the fishing was good, probably a thousand stone a day between four of us. So it was a, it was a real good time. Back on the quay, another skipper is preparing to go to sea. Get everybody going here. 
Alan Duan is an Irishman by birth, but has been fishing out of Cornwall for 15 years. All right, guys. His boat, the Ajax, is one of 10 large Cornish netters fishing for hake from Neelan. Six o'clock Monday evening. We're a day late, the rest of the boats went a day ago, but we had a few jobs to do and we're all right, we'll catch up. <laughs> Alan needs to be back for Friday's market, four days away, to get the best price for his hake. They'll be in shops and restaurants for the weekend. Well, hake, to me, is one of the nicest fish you'll eat anyway. I've been fishing them for years and years and years, and it's not a new fishery to us but it's just that your public has seen it more. But it wouldn't have been on your, your supermarket counter, like haddock and cod, wouldn't it? You know what I mean? So, but now you have haddock, cod and hake. Cornish hake, once almost all exported to Europe, is now a bigger seller in the UK. Over 90% of it was exported to Spain. Now it's the other way around. Very, very little is exported now. The species was given a huge boost four years ago when the Marine Stewardship Council, or MSC, awarded some Newlin netters sustainable fishery status, meaning that stocks were healthy. And we got it, and the price has gone up since then, and it's becoming a good fishery here now. Well, I definitely think it has been worth it, you know. I don't think we'd be getting a good a price now today if we didn't have our egg MSC. Netting is a highly targeted type of fishing. Nets are laid in a straight line along the seabed, standing six feet high from the bottom. We've just started shooting. You know. We we'll have approximately 11 mile of net in the water by the time we're finished. Each one of these pounds here hold 1.9 miles, which is 30 nets, like you know. These are all egg nets. The nets are left in the ebb and flow of the tide for 12 hours waiting for the fish to swim into them. We have four mile fishing. Starting to make money now. Alan is fishing off the southwest coast of Cornwall. British waters extend 200 miles out to sea, sandwiched between Irish waters to the north and French to the south. But as part of the European Union, access to these fishing grounds is not exclusive. Who else is around? Well, of all Frenchmen, Another Frenchman here coming up. Frenchman, Frenchman, Dutchman. Dutchman up there with him. Frenchman, Frenchman, Frenchman. Irish, 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 naturally enough. All Spanish, look. No? All down along the shelf, look, no? all Spanish. Nearly all Hague boats there. There were about 300 Spanish boats to 10 Cornish boats fishing Hague here. <laughs> As members of the EU, Cornish boats must share these waters and their fish stocks with boats from all over Europe. And as part of the EU's common fisheries policy, some European fishermen are allowed to catch much more than their Cornish neighbours. Just have to keep an eye on that fella coming up here now. He's a French trawler. In these waters, British boats can land less than half the hake that French boats can. He's all right a while yet, but I'll have to keep an eye on him here now. I think part of the reason that a lot of fishermen voted for Brexit would be because of EU boats in the UK waters. You've got Spanish vessels, you've got Dutch vessels, you've got French vessels, they're all coming here, and some of them, 100% of their fishing, 100% of their effort is in British waters because this is where the stocks are and this is where they make their money. There's more French boats, foreign flag boats, than us. So who's taking more stock from the sea? Not us, they are. They're not breaking no laws at the moment, so it's like, if you ask me, if, we, if you come back and do this interview three, four, five months' time, Brexit's gone through, we're out, we've got our borders, we've got our exclusion zone, and they're in it, I'd probably answer it different. But at the moment, look, nobody's breaking any laws, so allowed to fish it, what, what do you want me to say? <laughs> Three. 
been a big week for Brexit. The UK is still no closer to a deal on what happens after we leave. There are more talks with the EU about the weekend. Degrés, still can't agree on Alan is below sleeping. The Ajax's 11 mile long curtain of nets have been fishing on the seabed through the night. But there's a problem. Basically, mate, this French geezer is not listening. He's not playing the game, is he? He's not playing the game, yeah. The California, a French trawler towing heavy gear along the seafloor, is heading straight for them. If she doesn't change course, she'll drag the nets away. These are our nets here. And then that's him. So basically, we're trying to get him to turn and go back down. But if he'll do it, that's anyone's guess. Losing their fishing nets would be costly. Six, seven thousand pounds worth of net. Yeah, and the rest. Help. Plus all the fish that are in it. <laughs> right, Matt. As the trawler moves closer, first mate Matt is called up to the wheelhouse. I've been on the radio twice now. California. California again. Can I get the handle down? Because, uh... He decides to steam out to the trawler and head it off. How many? Eight and a half, eight, seven. That's enough. At full speed, Matt is manoeuvring the Ajax between their net and the French boat. California, Ajax, California, Ajax, same go over. California, Ajax, California, Ajax, and receiving over. I'm just getting a bit closer to him now and then stay north side of him and sort of push him away from the end of that. It's... The plan has worked. The French trawler has changed its course. Just minutes from the Ajax's nets. We've scared him off. My name is Vitaly. I work here because I'm a fisherman. I like this job. It's hard, but it is interesting a lot. While some parts of our fishing industry have found themselves at odds with our European neighbors, others have come to depend on them. What? Bongos? In Newlin, with fewer young local men wanting to be fishermen, the industry has turned to foreign crews to fill the void. Newlin's crabbers are now almost entirely crewed by Latvians. I live on boat, I work on boat. Our boat is second home. I was studying in university after school. But then I think I need to go work somewhere. And my friend say need to work on crabs, so, and now I'm here. I was heard too much stories about fishing, fishing, so need to check how it, is it. Like, like in shitty weather, go in sea and it will be woo, like this, and you can't even work, you can't even sleep, you can't stand on one place, so it's a little bit funny. The biggest crab fleet in Cornwall belongs to the Rouses, an ambitious local family business that catches, processes, and sells their own shellfish on a scale unrivaled in the southwest. If there's a, sometimes a bit of a language barrier issue, but normally it's too bad. Normally it's all right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's true. It's true. He knows it. <laughs> Our company relies on the free movement of people. You know, people say there's too much immigration in this country, but I don't see there are many people queuing up the key to replace the jobs. Without the Eastern European workers, who's going to catch crabs? Who's going to pick the crabs? 
And now the shipping forecast issued by the Met Office on behalf of the Maritime and Coast Guard Agency at 0015. There are warnings of gales in Viking, South at Zero, Forties, Cromarty, Fourth, Tyne, Dogger, Fisher... We do two Germany, hours, lift one string, put it on the deck, and then go to Seleucia. Skipper Ben Rouse is heading out to sea on the newest boat in the family's fleet, the Nimrod. Come on, come on. Yeah, 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 we're going. Drop that rope. Oh, I always drop it. Someone do it. Yeah, well, we we'll just uh, steam out here now. The boys put the ropes in all the way. Uh, it's freshening up in the morning. Gust of 40s, I think, they're giving. Easily as well, so it's cold wind. Nasty, bitter wind. Ben and his crew of three Latvians and two Englishmen are heading around 70 miles southwest. Lovely start to the day, anyway. <laughs> At just under 15 metres in length, the Nimrod is almost twice the size of the inshore crabbers. Obviously, on a bigger boat like this, with the more pots, you can cover more ground, you can work ground that the, uh, the punts can't get to, obviously. Ben can not only work further out, but through bad weather. Most of the smaller crabbers are now tied up, waiting for the weather to improve. This is our time. <laughs> Christmas time, when the weather's not so good and everybody's crying out for crab and the price is high. Push a bit more weather this time of year than it normally would through the summer, like, this time of year. It's not viable to take a day off. I mean, we can come out and the boys can earn three, four hundred quid for the day. Or they can sit in the pub and spend two hundred quid <laughs> quite easily, like. Ben and his crew work around 1,500 crab pots, hauling strings of 70 at a time. For the next 48 hours, they'll work around the clock. BBC Radio 2, are you stockpiling food because you're worried about a no-deal Brexit? Maybe you're already filling the cupboards with pasta, rice and tinned goods in case supplies are disrupted for a month or two. Maybe longer. Here we are, mate. Yeah. Seems like they've never been away. West of the Isles of Scilly, the Billy Roney has reached its fishing grounds. All right, Dan. Compared to netters, beam trawlers are indiscriminate. Two 10-metre steel beams with heavy chain mats are dragged along the seabed. What's going on? Scooping up right. bottom-dwelling fish into the nets. Once the gear's in the water now, the boats will fish 24-7 until it's time to go home again. The process of what we're actually doing doesn't stop day or night, it just keeps going now, so... After trawling for three hours, it's time to haul. Right, John. Clear. Danny may dream of being a skipper, but for now, he's still a deckhand. And that means getting his hands dirty. Looking all right, mate, in a minute. Few of them there. Dogfish. Yeah. These are the ones you're after. Beauties. Weighs a ton of them. Ooh. This is quite a decent haul, actually. The catch reflects the richness of the waters. Only species with little commercial value and juvenile fish are thrown back. With plenty of soles and monkfish, this single haul is worth around a thousand pounds. Those can make decent money being a fisherman. But also get to be quite wise with your money as well. But I like nice stuff. Nice cars, nice clothes, nice jewellery. And this stuff pays for it all. Two-day millionaires. That's what we are, two-day millionaires. The Ajax's nets have been fishing for 12 hours. It's now time to haul. First haul, first stand, first haul on the trip. This is my big brother live every day. <laughs> Alan's about to find out if he's caught any hake. Dogfish. Dogfish. He's all at the minute. Another one coming in a minute, watch. There he is, is he? 
Ah, oh, there he is. Two of them. This is not what I wanted, to be quite honest with you. Dogfish, or spur dogs, are a type of shark. Once sold in chip shops as rock salmon, now classed as a vulnerable species. EU rules mean they must be thrown back, dead or alive. But Alan is part of a scheme that means he can keep a percentage of any dead dogs. We're allowed to keep two ton every month on condition that we report in every day, positions we're in, many nets we've shot, how many dogs we've caught alive and let go, how many dogs we've discarded, dead, over our two ton, under our two ton, we don't discard anything. Even though I'm not here to target dogs, like, but if I catch them, I want to keep them, rather than throw them out dead, like. I just pack something coming here now, like. It's a bad start. Alan and his crew are risking life and limb for little reward. Offshore fishing is the most dangerous part of an industry that, on average, claims the lives of eight men every year. It's a moving factory floor, isn't it? Everything you see today with winches and ropes and anchors and nets going out and nets coming in, falling out over the side, dead, everything is breaking arms, breaking. It's not just minor little cuts and bruises. If something seriously happens, you know, it's serious, serious injury and death, you know. Say there's not any fishermen that don't that haven't lost a friend or a family relative that they know, you know. Uh, lost a brother, yeah, 19. 91. Drowned bass fishing himself and his friend. Myself and my other brother was on another boat at the time. My other two brothers was on another boat. No one alive to tell the story, so only two of them in the boats, and two of them were drowned. So no, we don't know what happened. And after that uh, happened, none of us ever fished together after. It's too much in there. Too much on the family, on the mothers and fathers and wives and that in there. I'm going to get a cup of tea while Danny Olsen shoots this one. It's time to haul the nets again. Skipper in training Danny is learning on the job and has been handed the controls. I've been doing this quite often, you know, while I'm waiting on doing my ticket. There's loads of things to think about, making sure everyone's clear. Hauling and shooting is probably the time that most things are going to go wrong. The two trawls are suspended on thick steel cables from two giant derrick arms. They weigh six tons each. Wire parts could snap and take one of the men out on deck. Uh, derrick could come down. Gear's coming up here now. It does get a bit daunting up here. While Danny is in the wheelhouse, the safety of the boat and the crew are in his hands. Sorry. Right. Right. I can walk part or I don't come down. It could easily kill somebody. Easily. If you stood in the wrong place at the wrong time, that's it, you're gonna. Run it up a bit more, mate. Yeah, this is what it's all leading up to, being here all the time, then, hopefully. Hang on, John. And that is that. I 
On the menu tonight is a la carte. <laughs> uh, leeks, cauliflower, roast potatoes, mashed potatoes, Yorkshire's, carrots, swede, cauliflower, leeks. Ah, as if I get time. See that, look. An out of date fishing boat, and we got all the mod cons. We started off at a lower stop on the east coast. That's where I first started. Oh, and I regretted it ever since. Well, <coughs> the fishing packed up in Lowestoft, so uh, that was either I didn't know nothing else. I was either come down here or go on the rigs. There's nothing in Lowson. It's a dead town. There's no fishing boats over there. Restrictions. They couldn't make a pay. When I first started fishing, this place, Newland, was filled to the gunnels with boats. Everybody made a living and everybody made a good living but it has declined massively, what with decommissioning and fishing effort and stuff like that, you know. In the 90s, to preserve failing fish stocks, stricter European quotas were introduced. The British government struck a deal with Brussels to reduce the UK's fishing fleet. Hundreds of British boats were decommissioned and scrapped. It was a very sad time. It was. It, it went on for 18 months, two years. There was boats, you know, really good boats. There's nothing wrong with them being cut to pieces, with chainsaws and smashed up with diggers. I can see now, I can see some owners uh, looking at their boat being that they lived in, basically, for 30, 40 years, which was a part of them being chopped up. And it was quite an emotional time for, for them and, and for the community. The Cornish MPs told the Environment Secretary that fishermen in Cornwall have no trust that he can deliver for them. Cheryl Murray's comments We'll haul four now today and see what it is. We won't have many dogs today. It's fairly sure of that. Dogs usually shift, you know what I mean? They're very fast. They move very fast. They're here today and they're 40 miles away now, you know. Somebody else's problem. <laughs> Tom's got a late wait. Just go the shade. The crew of the Ajax are on their second hull. It's been a poor trip so far. If Alan wants to make the lucrative Friday market, he needs to hit some hake soon. This is what's on today, though. So glad I'm not on the deck. <laughs> well, we'll leave that to the youngsters. There's a hake. Jeez, they're good fish here today. Another hake. Yeah, nice fish. It's a good start. Plenty of prime hake coming over the side. All our hake is fished sustainably and sold as sustainably caught product. The Ajax is limited by quota to around 300 tonnes of hake a year. But to qualify as an MSC sustainable fishery, they use nets with mesh sizes larger than the minimum legal limit by only targeting the larger fish allowing juvenile fish to swim free they help the future of the stock the hake that we catch net is msc the hake that the beamers catch even though it's cornwash cornish beamers is not msc it's only netted hake that's msc the public are more conscious of where their food comes from, where their vegetables are grown, where their meat is cut, what farm yard it comes from, uh, what country it comes from. So as it should be with fish as well, like, and that's what the MSC does to our fish. Like. They're on to a good run. With less than half their nets aboard, they've got almost five tons of hake already. This fishing is all right here today. On the Billy Roney, the weather's beginning to take a turn for the worse. Yeah, yeah. 
but it'll take more than this to stop Steve and his crew. Clear. All right, watch yourselves. They're more than halfway through the trip, and I've completed over 20 hulls. They're very expensive stone souls. Make a lot of money, and we've got to chuck them away. Simple as that. The boat's been catching well. Too well. We had a decent start, first couple of days, that was OK. Now we're coming up against the quota. <laughs> We're running out of quota. Most commercial fish stocks are subject to quota. Strict limits to the amount of fish that can be caught. Once you've hit your quota for a species, anything else you catch must be thrown back, even if it's already dead. Hungry people were throwing it away. Disgusting. Right, we're going to have to go back to the quota the species of the soul and the haddock that I want to catch this trip. <laughs> it's difficult fishing when sometimes you you don't want to catch it. You know, you want to be away from it. Well, it's not in our nature, it's not in my nature to tow away from fish, you know? But uh, I'm afraid the way the quota system is, that, that we have to do it to, to make sure that we can work all year and the vessel can work all year, you know? Part of the skill in being a skipper is spreading your quota over 12 months, ensuring a regular wage for the crew. Danny now, because he's taking that next step up, he, he will start learning this and he will start eventually having to work this lot out for himself. And uh, then he'll have the headache of opening the window and telling the, the men that they've got to start chucking the fish away again and having all the glum faces look back at you. Few dispute that quotas have helped preserve fish stocks but British fishermen have felt increasingly frustrated by rules which they see as unfair and lacking common sense. We're throwing thousands and thousands of pounds of dead fish over the side because Brussels tells us we have to. Where other country, countries keep most of what they can because they have more slice of the pie. So I think fishermen want our waters and our quota back. The way it is at the moment, you can get two boats out there. We could be here. There's a Frenchman 60, 80 feet away from me. If we get a catch, we get to throw it back. They can take it home. They got more quota than us, and the fish in our RC. It's it's very frustrating. I mean, the quota is shared up. It comes from Brussels, and it's shared up. This Brexit's going to be where the, I think a lot of the fishermen were led to believe that'd be it. We'd have our own waters back again. We'd have all our own quota. There'd be nobody else fishing it. It won't be me making them decisions. It'll be somebody else who'll be making it for me, and then I'll get another bit of paper like this, and I'll have to go off and do what I do. In the run-up to the referendum, fishing became one of the most powerful arguments for leave. Fishing is the acid test of Brexit. Fishing boats from across the country have taken the message to the heart of the capital today. Their flags had a simple message, all urging voters to leave the EU. It's quite amazing. There it goes, powered in our dumping fish in the Thames. What a, what a waste. I mean, beautiful eating fish. And this is happening. 9%. 9% of the habit quota is all the UK fleet gets from the European Union. With the health of our fishing industry and the management of our fish stocks, has been undermined. More than half of the fish in our own waters has been caught by foreign vessels. The French get three times as much Dover sole, twice as much place, and six times as much cod. That is not fair. We will leave the customs union, we will leave the common fisheries policy, we will leave the common agricultural policy, and we will take back control of our money, laws, and borders. Fishing rights and taking back control of British waters are a big part of negotiations. But it's complicated. If UK and Ireland pulled out of Europe, well, they'd shut down the European fishery. Like. Europe wouldn't have a fishing fleet. They all told us fishing was going to be brilliant. It was going to be back. We were going to take back all our own waters. Nobody was going to... 
And even back then, I said, it's never going to happen. It can't happen. There's too many people fishing the waters. There's too many people rely on it. Just send four down straight away, yeah? And then we'll do one up, one down, one up, one down. The Nimrod is landing three tons of brown crab. 67! How much? 57. It's now time for this Latvian caught crab to be processed by Lithuanian pickers. Gerda is one of 19 Lithuanian women working here. So the reason I came here, you can earn a lot more money than in Lithuania because with salaries in Lithuania, it's kind of a sad situation now. A minimum salary per month is uh, about 400 euros. Yeah, yeah. So you can earn that in summer per week here. It is really, really good money. It's a hard job. So you have to pay the right money to get good workers. Now, these are not a cheap labour force. As you see, there's lots of wages going out of here. Most of these girls will earn, on average, about 30,000 a year. Gerda has been working here for three years, but as an EU national, doing what would be classed as a low-skilled job, her future here, after Brexit, is uncertain. It was, like, kind of a strange decision. I don't know why they did this, but they choice, and we cannot do anything about that now. Gerda and her fellow pickers are among an estimated 10,000 EU workers in the UK's fish processing industry. If we find that we can't employ a European workforce into the UK as, as we do now, then our vessels and our processing company will move to France. We have exactly the same fishing opportunities, we fish exactly the same grounds, and we'll just move all of our company to there. There's the hick. Yeah, nice fish. The crew of the Ajax have been hauling for nearly 12 hours, catching, gutting and packing hake. Yes, sir. After three days at sea, Alan will be able to make Friday's market. That's the way you want it, isn't it? Catching it here now on Tuesday and Wednesday and people are eating it on Friday night. It's as fresh as you're going to get, you know. He liked this. Watch him hopping around the place now. You have to do a bit of dancing there now. Go on. fish in the boat. So, yeah, it is a relief. Job, isn't it? There's a skipper aboard the boat. Every single person that's involved in that boat is relying on you. Everybody. From the owners, to the owners' families, to the crews, to the crews' families, to you and to your family. Everyone is relying on you. This is BBC Radio 4 Longwave, where now it's time for the shipping forecast. Right. By the Met Office on behalf of the Maritime and Coast Guard. I know it's going to be horrible. It's going to be a horrible forecast. In the wheelhouse of the Billy Roney, Danny's on watch. There are warnings of gales in Viking, Forties, Cromarty, Forth, Portland, Plymouth, Biscay, Trafalgar, Fitzroy, Seoul, Lundy, Fastnet, Irish Sea, Shannon, Rockall, Malin, Hebrides, Bailey, Fair Isle, Faroes. And southeast Iceland. So basically everywhere. Plymouth, south or southwest, five or six, increasing seven to severe gale nine later. Rain or showers, good, occasionally poor. Irish Sea, southeast. Well, that's the one we're after. It's not looking too pretty. 
Seven to nines later. Seven to nines all round, pretty much. It gets pretty bad sometimes. Like, really bad. It's just mountainous waves, howling wind, freezing rain. Yeah, it's horrible. Dawn breaks, and so does the storm. Take it easy out there, all right? He's certainly starting to freshen up. He's doing what they said. You know, you can go from flat and calm, and then literally within half an hour, hour, you can have uh, a gale of wind. It's, that's how quick it can change. Steve has a decision to make. Stay out or make for port. The problem with this weather, you... you you tend to get the odd wave that will be twice the size of all the rest. Just drop aboard the boat and, and fill, the, fill the decks with water completely. That's, that's when it, gets, it can get dangerous. Like. Working through the weather will mean more fish in the hold. All right, Dan! But risks the safety of his crew and his boat. Go steady, watch the boys, keep everybody safe. Give each other a hand, it'd be a bit easier, wouldn't it? It's all about looking after them now. Yeah, we're fishing, but it's more about looking after them, make sure they're all OK. Steve decides to gamble and work through the storm. Cos it's the market's an auction and it, it's a supply and demand. It's like a little bit of weather helps us purely because some of the smaller boats will go in and then the fish will be when by the time we get in, the, the plan hopefully will be that there won't be so much fish on the market. And then the less amount of fish, and the more the buyers want it, hopefully they'll start a little bit of a bidding frenzy going on. And, and for what we've got, it'll, it'll sell for more. Now the Billy Roney is the only Cornish beamer left fishing this far offshore. The rest of the fleet has run for shelter. When all the other ones are going in, you think, oh, I won't mind being on them right now. But then... It pays off when all them are in, you're out, you go in, prices are up, better money, you know? So it's a double-edged sword, that one. I'll only push what I feel safe for the, the boat and the crew, like, you know? I mean, yeah, it's, it's nice to get some fish, it's nice to fill her up, but weather's weather, we work it. I work it till I feel that uh, I can't work it. And saying that, we don't stop working very often. So. <laughs> this might be risky business, but rewards are steadily building down in the hold. With a hold full of fish, Alan and the crew of the Ajax are heading for home. We're on the last hour now. Ronald's going by. Sustainably caught Cornish hake is on the up, with UK supermarkets now stocking it on their shelves and fish counters. This is where the MSC and the supermarkets come in, you know. You know, you're talking about Tesco's, Aldi, Morrison's. Who would I miss out? You know what I mean? Big customer base, isn't it? If we didn't have MSC on our hake, it wouldn't be in them supermarkets. So. With the MSC, I would say the price of hake has probably risen 90 pence to a pound a kilo, more, maybe pound 10. It mightn't sound like a lot, but if you land nine ton, it's 9,000 kilo, isn't it? It'll be what it'll be now. They're in there. Our job is done. Start again now. Empty boat. Same problem again. Where to go, what to do. When to shoot, when not to shoot. Alan's hake was sold the following morning. His catch totaled just over 20 grand. Good money for him and his crew. Uh, 
is not right there big time by the sounds of that. The engine on the Billy Roney has stopped dead. Danny! Just got something to go bang on the engine. That's the end of play, I think. The crew have discovered a large piece of discarded net tangled in the boat's propeller. You get it floating on the surface sometimes. When you get these scuffy conditions, you can't always see it. With the propeller out of action, the boat is drifting helplessly in high winds and seas. Daddy! <whistles> Steve must haul up the trawls from the seabed before they get tangled beneath the boat. Yeah. Your boat will turn, and if you're not careful, your wires on your gear, oh, oh, cable lay, they'll lay, the lock, and it'll lock the gear together. So when you pull tight, instead of the gear coming up separate, the gear comes together, and then uh, that's another mess you really don't want on, on top of this side, you know? All right. Get away! The gear is safely right. back on the surface. But the boat needs rescuing. All right, fish, can you hear me? Steve contacts one of the other beamers in the fleet, the Traversa. Hi, right, mate. Luke, we got a Frenchman's trawl straight through her arse, mate. She won't go ahead in the stern. She stopped dead in the water. Uh, I don't know who's about with anybody fancies coming and getting us or what. You don't mind, mate, yeah? The Traversa agrees to come to the rescue, but there are six hours steam away. All Steve and the crew can do is sit and wait. When things go wrong aboard these, especially aboard the beamers, they tend to be biggish things and can be dangerous things. And uh, I think if I lose the plot and start running around like headless chicken and everybody else follows me, we're going to be in the right mess. This is the Travessa coming up on our stern. I'm not quite sure how far he is. All right, my man, I'll get him up there. All ready, boys? Yeah. Right on. As the Traversa moves closer, the crewmen take their stations, and Steve takes charge out in the bow. No, we're winging to him, mate, all right? We've got Uber over here if we need one. This is where they've got to be very careful. But it is dangerous, especially in this weather. Where she's rolling so much. Here he comes, Robin Hood. <laughs> Watch your fingers, all right? Fingers, hands, and everything else. In heavy swell, the boats can't get too close, but they need to be close enough to get a tow line across. If they collide out here, it could be catastrophic. We're gonna have a struggle. He's got wind of us. The Traversa moves to within just metres of the Billy Roney. There you go, John. He's here now. Yeah, lovely job. We're on. The rope is across. They got it. They're just pulling the. The wire in the board now. And again. Look at that. You want to get the hammer? Give it a nick. That's you. Get out of the way. Feet out of the way. All right, watch. That's going to come tight. All right, back out. I'm back out of the way. Just make that up back there, Dan. All right, off the well back. Out of the way, John. Out of the way, John. That is not an easy job in a breeze of wind. I've done it plenty of times myself, and I can guarantee it's not. But he's got us now, thankfully. Oh, job well done. Take my hat off to him. Righto, lights off. Bound for Newlin. Always pleased to see home, mate. 
would have been nicer to come home under our own steam, but there you go. We're home, it's all that counts. For the crew of the Billy Roney, it's been a tough week offshore. For the youngest hand, it's all valuable experience. Nelly the head, look, look, that's land, that's land. For old John the Pud, it's another week in over 60 years at sea. I remember he used to say to me, if I stop, I'll die. So, if he wants to carry on, let him carry on. He, he's quite happy to annoy us for a few more years, I reckon. I think what he's, he's waiting is for me to get the rest of my ticket, and then he's going to retire then. Hi, right, coming up. Oh, I should be the only fish on the market in the morning. You! With a bit of luck, so if there's only us and the buyers want it, then hopefully they'll bid. And bid good, though, you know? Fingers crossed. The following morning, the Billy Rowney's catch is up for auction. It's the only fish on the market. 15, 15, 50 on the turbo. 15, 50 and a 16, 50. Cool. And a 17, 50. Yeah. And an 18, 50. And a 19. 1850. On the boat, Steve, Danny and the rest of the crew are eagerly waiting to hear if their hard work has paid off. Hiya, mate. All right, have you got Italian for us, bud? Yeah, 40,193. To phone the office, first total, 40,193. 40 grand, boy. See, now, because it's 40 grand now, it, all that was pretty much worth it, wasn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah, happy enough with that. After costs are deducted and the boat's owners take their share, the rest is divided up between the crew. They get to drive the boat. <laughs> As deck hand and engineer, Danny will take home about 1,500 quid for the week's work. Give it a little touch over towards the quay. If he does one day become a skipper, he can expect a bigger share. Danny gets his ticket, and I'm quite sure he'd be wheelhouse material all day long. I straighten her up a little bit. But with greater rewards comes greater responsibility. I like to think I'm ready to be a skipper. I just think it's something that I've always wanted, that's all. Come on, Stern. If you're going to be in a job, be at the top of the game, that's, that's it, isn't it? She's coming in, lovely. Yeah, he's come a long way, Danny has. I've watched him change a lot, I've watched him grow up a lot. You can't just walk off the street, go and sit and do a bit of paperwork and then step aboard a boat and say, right, I'm skipping. It doesn't work like that. You have to work from the bottom up and through, and that's what you'll need to keep this industry going. You no know, matter what happens with Brexit, if there isn't no men to do the job, then that's going to finish it anyway. The winds of change are blowing through Cornwall's biggest pores. I'm still, I'm still defined as the new harbour master. Well, I'm not Cornish, so I'll always be new. Not everyone's happy. As soon as you start a project which involves stakeholders, get them involved. Big money's on the line, and the clock is ticking. There's a lot of changes going on in New York at the moment, and not all of them for better. If you would like to find out more about the UK's fishing industry and how it's changing, the Open University has produced a free poster. Order your copy by calling 0300 303 3827 or go to bbc.co.uk forward slash fishing life and follow the links to the Open University.